beautifully when you said it's a fundamental property, we'll call it that, of the mother to be free, to want to express itself through diversity, to multiply itself infinitely. And you brought up that idea that even a single object from different perspectives of different beings, it's not a single object. It expresses itself infinitely through different kinds of consciousnesses. Okay? That last one you just brought up, that point, was wonderfully strange and complex. You brought up the notion of cosmic evolution, which I've heard all the ways the people talk about it. But you talked about the book itself is not conscious of itself. Now I'm putting the words in your mouth. In that sense, Siva, it isn't conscious of itself as Siva yet. It experiences its, 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 its being through me, my conceptualization of something called a book, in my subjective experience, is what it allows exist as, as Siva. You're saying, and then you link that somehow that that has something to do with the evolution of a book towards eventual self-awareness. So this is a very complicated thing, but that was a very complicated talk you gave. <laughs> I wanted to hear more about what is self-consciousness, self-awareness? If everything is consciousness, but you're saying that in my subjective experience of consciousness, apparently this thing is not self-aware. But this subjective experience here is self-aware. This is a location yeah. in the mother, which is an experience of self-awareness. So I'm asking, you started out with this question, how can this and this be the same expression of oneness? But self-awareness exists in this location, but not in other locations. That's a, that's a, thank you. No, you it, also, was a, it was an amazingly complicated talk. You thank did. you, uh, uh, thank you. You summarized a bit. Uh, thanks for that too. But what I mean here is the way I have felt it is. Let's start talking about my ego, or uh, not like ego arrogance type. What I mean is me. The, the core of my being, I am-ness. If um, somebody knocks me, touches me, pushes me, I say, don't touch me. My ego extends then to my body. If you come with a big sax and start digging a hole on the wall of my house. It hurts me. Why shall it hurt me? I'm not the one you are digging. My subjective experience expands in such way that it also captures that inanimate object. Thus, the moment I give a part of me to my belonging, that becomes part of me. I, the idea of me is elastic. Today I love you and if someone says mean words to you, it hurts me. Sometimes it hurts me when, like, I walk with my brother who doesn't understand English much, and then when another brother pulls a little bad joke on him, and it hurts me. When the subject himself is not hurt, why should I, not even part of that, feel the hurt? This I is extended to envelop that other subject, could be my family. If our neighbor regularly going to church says the Vedanta temple people are really crazy. <laughs> there is a collective consciousness hurt. Everybody will feel the hurt. There is not a real ego to be hurt there. Not one single real human being hurt. But why should we all feel the hurt? In the collective sense, sometimes it just erupts. 
you know, like uh, you are nice and nothing matters. And then if someone says really bad words about uh, maybe your um, gender stuff or race stuff or ethnic background or something, and then even nice people turn not too nice because they feel personally attacked, their ego hurts. The ego is elastic. We can constitute, or let me say, we can always negotiate the parameters of this ego. So the moment I am experiencing this book, oh, this is a book, Spanda Karika, I have pulled myself as a separate being, observing the object thrown out in the space and time that has been separated from me. The moment I objectify something, I pull my part of being to give a space for that part that is the other, that is the object. So is it just a fantasy? No, no. It's, it's the way consciousness manifests itself in the mechanism of constituting subject in the mechanism, mechanism of defining what makes something as object. So what is there to learn for, you know, forget about epistemology. What is there for us to learn uh, as a, a yogi? In the unawakened, the term the book gives is opera buddha in the unawakened state subject and object are fixed and frozen like given permanently and then it creates a four category of yogis apra buddha prabuddha uh, buddha supra buddha you know like it's like a well enlightened and then completely unawake and then in the completely unawake state, our subjective horizon is absolutely pulled out of the objective horizon. Things are there, I am here. There is no relation there. There is no possibility of, you know, somehow intermixing a breeze. It's like, uh, you know, like the, the pulp of coconut and the shell completely two different entities. But then uh, 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 we come to a higher and higher state in which this whole separation appears more and more flimsy. That is epistemically what I mean in our everyday experience that starts coming to reality. Like we start experiencing the world that way. That allows us to see that because my ego is flexible. I have no reason to permanently objectify everything else out there because it's elastic. A yogi expands in his heightened state of consciousness to envelop the totality. The state is called Purna Ahanta, Purna means complete, Ahanta means I-ness. What does that mean? It means you circumscribe everything that is there within your ego. From I-ness? I, 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 I-ness, ego. In this fully awakened ego sense, it's still the ego, but that is the objectless ego. Why is this objectless ego? Is because there is nothing thrown outside of the parameters of its being. Everything that exists, exists within the gaze of this yogi. Is it still subjective? The, yes, it's still it's subjective. The ultimate objective. Yeah, this is the absolute subjectivity. It's the ego of knowledge. This is the God consciousness. Right. Because in the God consciousness, everything is felt as my own being, my own pulsation. We want God to feel us 
as those miserable being and he could help us the problem is we are fantasizing God to be a rich man you know who could just give us a little money because the God the way God experiences is everything within it's it's not separated from his being how can God experience us from outside of his being because we are everything is within his subjective gaze when Shiva says, I am, that I am includes everything. When a particular neuron triggers in my head, that is that trigger neuron. But when I say I'm going to dance, I'm, I'm talking about the head and the body and I'm talking about everything, you know. So when a part has this little ego, that does not include the totality. But the, when the whole says, I, that includes everything within, the ocean, the eye consciousness, not of a bubble, but of the ocean. But there is yet more to go. But this is, this is kind of nice station for me to pause. So there's another question there. Can you ask your question? <coughs> yeah. I'm going to go for trying to make sense out of something I've been mulling over for many years. I really enjoyed hearing you talk specifically about the man who various perspectives, giving everyone a subjective view. It reminded me of my first lesson in journalism 50 years ago. There is no such thing as an objective reporter. Everything is someone's subjective evaluation. The closer I get to the fire, the more I see. The different way in which I write it. A politician, a homicide, a suicide. As you talked about Paul Brutton finding maybe one of his greater experiences in his traipsing through India, forming his subjective evaluations of the holy people, supposed holy people he finds. He encounters this guru who has him pick up whatever he sees in front of him, and the pebble turns into a beetle. What, what conflicts in my mind is the holy man, supposedly who is the expert on Advaitic tradition, using the example of the world to get you to better understand a subjective view versus an objective view, what is truth, what is real, what is God, who are you? Why the attention wouldn't instead be turned not on, I simply triggered the advancement of evolution by a couple of million years for the pebble to emerge, and that beetle's on its way to emerge into you. Why focus on that more? And this is a question I have of the study of Advaita Vedanta in general than the fact that it's all illusory, or at least some people say it's all illusory. And you began your talks, after all, by suggesting the same thing when you referenced, you talk about recognizing the play of the mother. Is it all a play? Which of these two narratives are we best to follow? <laughs> an illusion, including the pebble turning into yeah. the beetle, yeah. eventually destined to turning into man, yeah. or that none of it is real and yeah. focus your attention better there. Yeah. I don't know if I succeed in making that Thank you, and I don't think that I will be able to answer, but let me, I'm, in the, I'm in the standing now, so I, I have to try. Um, so, the play as a metaphor works both ways. When we say it's a play, we are saying it's not real. But when I'm saying it's a play, it's something real fun, and not saying it's not real. It's like a, uh, if you go and tell kids it's just a play, okay, forget about this monopoly. No, I, I remember being in that age playing monopoly, and it's not that I didn't know these currencies were not real but for the time being it used to be so real that I could actually uh, want to you know control more win more but that is still not what I'm saying because that's still a little bit of unreal type of metaphor 
The other metaphor of the play they give Krida te na kilam jagat. Krida is a play I'm talking about, not the drama play. Krida play means uh, like playing football or ping pong. Some of my friends are inviting me for the evening if I wanted to before our discourses. Uh, so, play is um, even in the most painful moments in our life. This is something already programmed in our being to experience these modes. And play in the sense that uh, I already know that I'm going to undergo these things and it's still thrilling. And sometimes I feel drowned and it's just like pushing yourself to if you have played any game, not like I'm just playing a drama, therefore I don't care whether I'm a pauper or a king, but if you are really a pauper, playing a pauper, then that's a, that's a kind of different game altogether. That, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pauper, I have no penny, but this is just another kind of sort of a play pastime to kind of just feel the way it feels to be a pauper. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what it is going to be like for this time being. Uh, so... The tragedies, I can see that this is happening, but this is my time to undergo these duraces or painful moments. And like, uh, you know, you are playing and then you, are, you feel like you are gonna lose the game. And then also when somebody says give up, no point, you are not gonna win. And you also know that you are not gonna win, but why don't you just give up? No, you are still enjoying somewhere. Okay, you know that you have lost the game and you are already four points behind or ten points behind. You know you have lost the game, but if, if someone were to say, give up, man, that's just like, no, I mean, no, I'm, 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 I don't just care for winning. You know? So the play in the sense that there is, there is little bit of fun just to keep on playing. Even in defeat, defeat I'm talking in the sense of tragedy, defeat I'm saying in the sense of loss, defeat in the sense I'm talking about uh, our painful experiences, that's what I mean by defeat. Even in pain and suffering, we continue our lives. If someone were to say, it looks like, uh, you know what, you are anyway sick and suffering, I mean, I have this best amazing pill for you. No, I, I don't want to die. But then the guy, if the guy argues, but you know what, I mean, what is there for you? Look, you say, what a cruel guy. Mm. Knowing the fact that every next day could be painful with certain level of depression or something, knowing that fact, we all subject to the heightened, to this optimal possible state of endurance, we sustain this being. Because why? That's Krita. Krita play in that sense, not in the sense it's all not real. But the real in the sense that even in painful moments, we are still having some type of fun that we don't want to say fun though, but there is, there is some kind of fun in the mode of being able to feel, even though it's painful, being able to uh, experience, undergo those moments. If I did not exist, I would not feel that being. I wouldn't feel pain. Just because I feel pain doesn't mean that I would want to negate my total being. So why? Because even in the painful moments, aham sukhecha dukthecha raktasche tyadi sambhira sukha devastha nyasyute vartante nyatrataha sputam verse 5 I guess from this book. I'm in pain. I'm happy. These, because these are just modes of expressions, not like completely unreal, but the powers, the energies, uh, the capacity, because why would you ever be okay to feel bad? Because you can. If you did not exist, you could not feel pain. Therefore, to be is better even when your existence embodies pain and suffering. That is the Shakta way of understanding. So, which one to choose? The, at the beginning, why, therefore, why I started is 
it's a, some people choose this way, other people choose that way. And some people say the water is warm, others say the water is cold. That's why I get that little background. But this Shakta philosophy says that even the painful moments are the very extension of our being. And so it's worth releasing the painful moments, just as well as the happy moments down all the way down there. Um, Make this the last question. A bit louder? Yeah, no, it's, it's all right. It's just have to be louder. I'm loud enough. Okay, sure. Um, isn't oneness automatically defined in some way by duality? Not to say that it's separated, but without pain, you don't understand what happiness is. And so, without knowing what the other side of something is, you can't... How would you experience being one? How would you have one... Without duality. I, yeah, I think I get that. The, the point is, there is one intrinsic inherent oneness, but that becomes almost like a, some kind of mystical teaching, some type of faith thing, as long as we do not recognize it. The undivided state of oneness is like that mystical state that has not been personally experienced. Shiva knows itself. Why shall bother creating this diversity in the form of the world? Because in this diversity, Shiva experiences oneness in this physicality. Without the body, Shiva would be just one, but would not recognize his oneness. To recognize, we need to have this pre-given, some type of sense consciousness. I recognize you, we met last time. Means there is already pre-given acquaintance and now, yeah, well, last year. So then there's some kind of past tense and then a re-experience. So this whole project following this Shiva philosophy is not just knowing Shiva. It's a recognizing Shiva in the body. Because disembodied being feels its oneness, but does not experience in the same way as the experienced yogis do while being in the body, being diverse, feel that oneness, experience that oneness. And that is the mission creation. So the, 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 the following Shaiva uh, uh, philosophy, the purpose of creation itself is to allow these fragmented subjects to experience their own fragmentary state, their wholeness. It was not needed to, be, to fragment in the very beginning then. But without that, it had no ego, no subjectivity, no otherness. And therefore, there is no recognition. There's just a pure consciousness, but not recognition. Now, we can recognize in such and so myriads of forms being my own expression. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For this uh, very meaty, enlightening, complicated, mm -hmm. it had everything. Mm -hmm. That is mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. T. Malsina, for this really enlightening experience. Um, he's taught this week uh, is the beginning of the Divine Mother, um, the celebration of Divine Mother. And actually, uh, in India specifically, that we celebrate. Durga, the Divine Mother as Durga, and uh, so from October 9th to October 19th, we'll be recognizing that divinity. And um, one of the ways to help recognize, as Dr. T. Malsinat was talking about, is to recognize your own divinity, is we, we sometimes we do a, uh, a chanting, and it could be taking a pledge during that time, during those 10 days, to chant your own mantra, or to chant Jai Sri Durga. And if you chant during this time, 
during this period, there's something magical, there's something that enhances the effect of your, of your chant. So, we actually have um, uh, uh, Drink Swami Swahananji's time, who was the uh, previous Swami before Swami Sarvadeva. He had wanted everybody to do a, sort of a chanting, uh, take this time to individually make a pledge and together chant. So uh, we have a sign-up sheet. If you'd like to take a pledge for your own self from October 9th to October 19th, during that very auspicious time, um, to take the benefits of chanting either your mantra or Jai Sri Durga, just as Dr. T. Molson, as a way of reflecting upon your own higher self, a way of connecting to that Divine Mother. And um, it's really interesting if you, uh, in some of our places in Belamont, our headquarters, they actually do the worship of the Divine Mother during those 10 days. And you'll see in that complicated worship, they're taking things from the soil from the prostitute's house, the soil from, uh, from a, a very uh, auspicious person's house. Both are offered to the Mother. All duality. Water from the specific ocean, water from, you know, not so clean water is offered to Mother. She represents that which the Devas, the gods come from. She represents that from which the Rakshas, the Asuras, the, the, de the devils come from. She represents our good side. She represents our lower sort of, a, sort of nature, beastly side. She represents all that. And we're asking, we're trying to get in tune with her. Because she is the one, in one sense, that has covered us in this world of duality. And she is the one that can also uncover this through her grace. This is the Divine Mother. So, again, there will be a sign-up paper. If you'd like to uh, hear this is, uh, sign, says, even a thousand extra a day is a matter of just basically an extra 15 minutes. Or you can do maybe pledge a hundred a day, which would be just a couple, like a couple of minutes. Whatever you like. But uh, if you'd like to do something, do it. Next week, Swami Sarvadevanath is coming. He's going to be speaking more on the theme of mother, mother worship. And this Tuesday, we um, have a Bhagavad Gita class. Shiva Shaktya Yukto Yadi Bhavati Shaktaha Pravavitam Noce devam devo na kalukushalaha spanditumapi Atastvam aradhyam harihara virincha divirapi Pranantum stotum ha katham akrita punya ha pravavati Drishadra giyasya daradalita nilote palarucha Daviyam samdinam snapaya kripaya mama pishive Anenayam dhanyo bhavati nacate ha niriyata Aneva harmeva samakara nipato himakara If Shiva is with Shakti, the world runs. If Shiva is separated from Shakti, even he cannot move. So there is no way for me to actually make prayers to you. Even then, O oh Mother, with your amazing gaze. Just a snippet of that. Cast that upon me. Not that I'm worthy of it, but because the moon shines equally, whether in the mansions or in the forests. Thank you so much.